If you guys will turn your books to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, we're going to cover quite a bit of scripture, but John chapter 1, the title of my message is Faith on the Word, Faith on the Word, and then I put in parentheses Jesus, so I'm talking about capital word, capital W, capital W word, you know, meaning Jesus is the word, and we're going to go through that, and even though this sermon is on a different subject, because what I want to really address is the attack on God's Word and, you know, how it's just coming on an onslaught. You know, the more you read in the news, the more you see out there, it's just a constant attack on God's Word. And I'm going to put it all together here in a second, but this order of, of or the sequence of verses that I'm going to use to show how Jesus is the Word and the Word was in the beginning, the Word is God and all these things. I actually learned them from a pastor in, in, uh, that I was, I was watching a sermon a couple months ago from another pastor. His name is uh, Roger Jimenez. And I really enjoyed this process because it really brings together, uh, for those that are maybe spiritually in the milk of the Word, that Jesus is the Word. You know, if you grew up or if you studied the Word long enough, you understand these things. But sometimes we just need to break it down for, for those that are new to the faith or those that are spiritually uh, young or, ha or, have, or still haven't gotten the meat of the Word. So if you look there in John 1, and, uh, and we're going to go to John 1, and uh, it's verses 1 through 5, we're going to see, it says, In the beginning was the Word, that's capital, that's, we know that's referring to Jesus if you studied your Bible. I'm not going to go into all of that today. We're preaching basically on what is the faith of the Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And I want to focus on that last part, and the darkness comprehended not. I really believe that there's an attack on the word of God, because darkness can't comprehend God's word. They can't comprehend how it is that we just believe on Jesus, that we have salvation through faith by grace, right? They can't believe that there is no works involved in it. They can't believe that there is a, you know, no explanations to them, that some of the things that they have questions for. You know, everybody wants to put a science or specific regiment to everything that we do in life, right? How did the world come about? And science tries to explain it through evolution. You know, how do we uh, heal? Well, we, we do it through medicine. Or how do we address, you know, the moral standard of life? Well, we do it through the governments. But reality is, that for us as Christians, we do it through the Word. And the attack is constantly coming, and we either have faith on the Word, meaning we have faith on Jesus, or we're going to fall for some of these traps that the devil's putting out there. And so let's look at the first point here. And actually, just go down to verse uh, 14, just to drive this point in. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see that the grace and truth emanate from the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we have to believe that Jesus was man and that He was God and that He dwelt among us. And we have scriptural proof that there was witnesses after He rose from the dead and also witnesses before He died on the cross. And so... The first point I want to make about having the faith on the Word or on Jesus Christ is that He was there in the beginning and He'll be there at the end. For us, right? I mean, we know God is eternal. He has no beginning or end. But our beginning and our end, Jesus was there. Jesus has been there, the Bible says there. Go back again in first, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. If we go to Genesis 1, it says, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we go to Revelation 19, Revelation 19, and after Revelation we'll be in 1 John, Revelation 19, verse 11, R Revelation 19, verse 11, we'll see that uh, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a horse, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And so there's another false uh, thing that we're going to see from the world, right? The world, 
uh, tells us that when Jesus came and if, what would Jesus do and how would Jesus, Jesus live his life, you know, that he wouldn't hate anything and he wouldn't fight with anybody and that he's just this big, long-haired hippie in sandals, you know, singing Kumbaya with the world. But the reality is God tells us that he is going to make war. And the Bible tells us that he came not to bring sword, I mean, uh, not to bring peace, but a sword. He's going to be div uh, divisive, right? But let's look at the other thing that points out there. It says, and they called, and he was, uh, and he sat upon him, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and those words are capitalized. We know that Jesus, the word, is faithful and it's true. So if we're going to stand up here behind a pulpit and preach the word of God, we have to honestly believe that this book that we're using, this, these pages that are, this ink that are on these pages are faithful and they're true to us. And a lot of people have attacked the Word of God. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest attacks is the, perver the perversions, as I like to call them, but versions of the Bible. There is none. There's only one version, which is God's inspired Word, and then we've preserved it over time. And, you know, one of the funniest things is people say, well, who wrote the Bible? God wrote the Bible. They're like, well, how do you know? Man, man wrote, you know, there's errors and all this stuff. And I never get into that argument because I th I, my, my point to them is, well, it, you know, either we believe that God's big enough to create the world and everything in it. So if he's big enough to do that, why wouldn't he be big enough to preserve his word? Either that or our faith is wavering, right? So let's keep reading there on uh, Revelation 19 and verse 12. He says, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his, and his name is called the Word of God. And so we see there, that making the reference back all the way to John, and we're going to see this theme kind of clear this up. Well, who is Jesus? He's the Word. He was made flesh. He's faithful. He's true. He was called the Word of God. And so we see that he's there in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we see here in Revelation 19, he's there at the end. You know, another thing that we have to have faith is that that is true. That these events that are told are prophesied of what's good to come for us. But Jesus is outside of time. God's outside of time. This has already been written out. It's already been seen in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite time. You know, I'm not going to sit here and try to explain how all that works. That's why we believe in God. Well, one of the reasons, right? Uh, the second point about having our faith in the Word or in Jesus is that we got to believe that the King James Version for the English speaking language is the Word of God. And you know, I've done uh, sermons on it and, and I'll probably do more sermons on the Word of God. I'm not going to go into all that history, but if you look at the history, if you study where we got our preserved Word, King James is the Word of God. And a lot of people want to destroy that. And, and so you have the NIV, and you have the NASB, and you have the, the message. None of those are the Word of God. And the biggest thing you're going to find is when you're looking at uh, these books uh, that they call the Bible, you're going to see a lot of uh, either verses omitted, or they're going to change the meaning of things. You know, some of the most common things is they'll get rid of you know, the fact that there's a virgin birth, or they'll get rid of the deity of Christ, or they'll just name Jesus Christ the Son, a created being, and He's not a God Almighty, or they'll just remove the Trinity all in itself. But actually, most versions get, got rid of the Trinity. You know, we're going to go there, 1 John 5, 7. You know, that's one of the, probably one of the most famous verses to uh, talk about the Trinity and talk about, you know, God being three in one. And if you just go to 1 John 5, 7, you know, the Bible tells us, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and that word there again is capitalized. That, that's referring to Jesus and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And one of the biggest arguments you're going to get from people, especially now that this, uh, you know, we're getting ready over the next few years and probably in the next century, I don't know, because I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you when Jesus is coming. I mean, there are clear signs. So one thing I know for sure, there's a couple things that haven't occurred that are biblical. So I know Jesus isn't coming tomorrow, you know, because people say, oh, well, if Jesus came right now, well, biblically, he's not. There's, there's a whole set of things that have to happen down in Israel. And there's a whole set of things that have to happen throughout the world. And that's not the sermon I'm preaching. But the one thing that, they're, that you're going to see is an attack on the Trinity and that deity of Christ. Look, the Bible says there are three that bear record, and these three are one. And that's it. 
Either we believe in the Word of God and how that works, Amen. or we don't. Because a lot of people try to get there and try to explain it all and try to go into detail. And the Bible backs it up. I mean, there is actual biblical explanations, but really if you wanted to, to uh, just overcome, especially if you're out there soul winning or you're talking to someone about Christ, this is the verse that I would go to. This is the easiest way to overcome the fact that God is three in one. And one of the big arguments you're going to hear is that, you know, it's uh, polytheistic. But if you study what polytheism is, it's a uh, multitude of deities, and not all of them, you know, it's kind of like they all, it's a, it's a deities of good and bad, and they all have different things that they, they stand for. You know, if you go down to like, you know, India, where they have a, a lot of gods, you know, that, that they worship false idols, and I'm talking little g, you know, you're going to find people, the god of fire, and the god of, you know, beauty, and the god of thunder and lightning. That's not how God works in the Bible. I mean, He is all in all. He created all. He's been there from the beginning. The Bible tells us they're three in one. And that's as simple as it gets. So we know He's there in the beginning. We know He's there in the end. You know, because God's word is our faith. We have faith on the word. We have faith on Jesus. We know that the King James is the word of God. And so we're following this trajectory. Now, the big thing is, is Jesus or the faith on word, how does it affect our lives? You know, are we going to let the attacks of the world come at us, or are we going to let them be dominated by God's Word? And if we go to Ephesians 5, if you'll turn to Ephesians 5, verse 23, just turn a few pages over to your left, and you go to Ephesians 5, verse 23, we're going to go verse 23 through verse 27. Ephesians 5, verse 23 to verse 27 says that he might... I mean, I'm sorry, first 23 to 27. I, I, got, I started reading 27. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Who is the Savior of the body? Christ. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so we see a couple of things. This is God establishing a hierarchy and reminding us of, you know, the church and family and even a governmental authority in the sense that we, you know, anytime you're governed, even if it's the church governing the congregation or the family governing, the, the, the husband governing the family, that's a, gover it's a small form of government, right? And one thing that we see is, what is the attack on God's word? Well, we're destroying families. We're destroying the way that the church is run. You know, we're, we're, we're redefining what is the church, right? I mean, we can go to verses where it says that it's uh, that the, the women should keep silence in the church, meaning they're not going to get up here and preach sermons and educate and teach men and women and children about God's Word. I mean, that's very specific, but we've attacked it. And nowadays, we have women preachers and we have sodomite preachers, and I'm, and I'm using that the way the world does. Obviously, anybody who doesn't follow God's biblical standard of preaching is not a preacher. That's very simple to point out, but that's what the world has done. And they've done that because they're, they don't have the faith on God's Word. They don't believe on Jesus Christ, that He is the Word. You know, if you look, uh, turn over to 1 Timothy 3.15, just go back over to your right. Uh, 1 Timothy, you know, so you got Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, uh, Thessalonians, and then you go to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, and we're going to go verse 15 through 16. 1 Timothy 3.15 uh, <clears throat> is it First Timothy, three fifteen? Give me a second here. I might have written my my notes uh, wrong, but I have them right here. But if I tarry, oh, you know, it is. I'm just my numbers are off in my eyes. Sometimes that happens, but it's okay. It says, "But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how that that uh, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God." which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So we've seen verses that, that refer to God as the Word, and He's faithful, and He's true, and that's referring to Jesus. And now it's telling us the pillar 
of ground uh, and the ground of truth and without controversy great is the mystery and godliness God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles believed in the world received up into glory and so we see there that the foundation and that truth on that foundation is Jesus the Word of God right and the challenge that we have nowadays is that People don't want to believe this doctrine. It's so funny that, you know, even a sermon like this can cause controversy because, you know, I've heard stuff, you know, they'll take some of these, these verses out of context, you know, about the controversy, you know, and without, great con without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Well, one of the things that we, we've got to have is that faith that Jesus is the Word. There is no controversy. The Bible's made it very clear. And the other thing we've got to have faith in is that it is a mystery, how all this came about. God only gives us so much in His Word, right? He explains certain things. Beyond that, now we're running into the realm of the, mis the mysterious, and what happens is once we get in there, it's our human nature to want to try to explain that mystery. And, and, and you know, most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, we're going to fail unless we just back it with God's Word. And so how does it affect our lives? Is that we've got to know that God's created this hierarchy for, for us. You know, He's done the, Jesus is, is the salvation of our lives. And then through the salvation, we have the church. And I'm talking about a biblical church that preaches God's Word, not just the building that people go to. You know, like people say, well, Joel Osteen's church. No, that's not a church. To me, this is a church. A church is where we congregate to learn the Word of God. And then what do we do? We know as the husbands, we teach our wives and our children on the Word of God, and we create that system. So we have to be very careful how, we, how that attack comes into the Word of God, right? The fourth point I want to make is, uh, John. go to John 17. John 17, we're only going to look at one verse there. Go back to John. Is point number four is that He is the truth. And so when we're talking about facts and science and proof and show me this and show me that and signs and, you know, we could preach on that for hours just on that point alone, you know, I mean, even Jesus... Uh, you know, even Abraham told the rich man, he said, look, there's no point sending anybody. If they didn't believe, they're not going to believe the signs and miracles. And we see the signs and miracles even today. I mean, the prophecies of God in His Word are coming true. They've come true. There's historical uh, proof and there's historical backing for all this. But we still twist it. The world still wants to twist that and say that it's not true. That it's, you know, I've heard so much as people say that, you know, the, the Bible is just a book of fictional fairy tale characters and it's got some good moral stories that help along. That's not the way I see it. The way I see it is this is my guide for this time, this life, and it's showing me the hope for our eternal life. And we don't even understand the fullness of what we're going to live in eternity, but it, lo it looks pretty good from right here. Just from this, I'm, I'm pretty excited. But John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when we're going to talk about truth and lies, deception, or fake news, as people like to call it, or whatever they're arguing, you know, we, the world uses science or the validity of some letters and numbers and whatever behind people's names. But for us, we know that thy word is Jesus, this word, this book that I'm holding right here is truth. And so, for the most part, we can address most of life's issues with the Bible. And we can speak all the truth that we need to speak and, you know, not have to get into a lot of, you know, discussion or debate or lose our, our emotions or our time or our sleep over these kind of stupidities that are going on in the world, these attacks. And I'm going to close with some of the attacks that we're seeing. And this is not an inclusive list. There's a lot out there. But it's very interesting how all these attacks, when I start naming them, you're going to see how it's an attack on God's Word, how it's an attack on our faith, on Jesus Christ, that He is the Word, you know, that He was there in the beginning. And that uh, it does affect the way that not only we believe, but then how we live after we believe. See, there's a lot of people that are saved, but they're not preaching God's Word to the full extent. You know, there's a lot of people, that reminds me of Lot, right? Lot was spared, but he wasn't preaching God's Word, because if he was, he would have never even been in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
He would have never stepped into that filthiness because the Bible says to separate ourselves, right? To walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. To not sit, uh, sit in the seat of the scornful. But uh, let's go, go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Actually, go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter. Uh, and, uh, and I'll go to 2 Corinthians 5. Go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter 1. And I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to go look at verse uh, 21. And it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So if we follow this trajectory of our faith in Jesus Christ, that he is the word, that he's faithful, that he's truth, and then that we just read that he is the that he sanctifies us in his word, right? That sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Well then, now we understand that for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And the Bible, I mean, there's so many verses that allude to that, but that tell us that, you know, he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a reason and a plan for God's uh, word and why things had to be the way that they were. But it wasn't for us to understand that. For us to under, what we need to understand is the very first thing is that once we have that faith, we're believing unto eternity. And when we do that, we have to understand that He was made sin for us because there's nothing that we can do in our lives, this attack in our lives, to get into heaven. You know, one of the games that people like to play is, and you know, I, I'm not going to allude to it because I, I just preached on it on Sunday, and, and I'm, it's one of the themes I've been just kind of picking on, but people want to say they're saved by grace through Jesus Christ, but, you know, they're always giving you that but, and I'm not going to go into all that because I just addressed it, you know, just this Sunday. But the big thing is they're playing that game that they're bigger than God. And look, if God wanted a but, then he would have not had to send his son and he wouldn't have made him to be sin for us. What's the point of making his son be sin for us if we can fix our own sin? What's the point of him saving us if we can save ourselves? So what's the point of having grace but? I mean, it's all or nothing, right? Let's look at the fifth point. You know, just a real quick recap. You know, we have to have faith on the Word or on Jesus. We have to believe that He was there in the beginning and in the end. We have to believe that the King James for the English-speaking people is the Word of God. And that we don't, we don't budge on that. We don't balk on that. And you can look it up. I mean, do your research. Learn, you know, study to show thyself approved. We, we see that in our life. You can tell. You know, the Bible says, by the fruits you shall know them. And what's interesting is I really believe, you know, I love that part in Galatians where it says the works of the flesh. And then you read all those, those verses and then it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the works of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. See, if we don't have the right fruit, we can't get the right work done. You know, and then that He is the truth. That Jesus is truth and that God's Word is truth. And the fifth point is that the Word is eternal. You know, go to 1 Peter if you're already there. Uh, let me get there with you guys. Let's go to 1 Peter real quick. 1 Peter 1, and go to verse 23. 1 Peter 1, and verse 23. And we see here, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So if he's faithful and he's true and he's righteous, the only way to do that, to have absolute faithfulness, to have absolute truth, to have absolute righteousness, is to be incorruptible, right? It says being born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, not being able to waste away, not being able to destroy, right? Uh, it says by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Go up to verse 21, it says, Whom, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So who do we believe? We believe in God and the Word, right? And when we believe in God, we believe that God sent his Son, Jesus, to die for sin, so we believe on Jesus Christ, right? And I'm not, obviously, if you're sitting here today, you've heard many sermons about how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm making that point here. Go to Psalm 12, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. And, uh, you know, as I was preparing for the sermon, uh, you know, you're just picking all, you're going through the progression of the, of the verses and all that stuff. But I, I don't think it's coincidence that, you know, I told Pastor Cobb just this week 
we have a like-minded brother and sister in Christ. Uh, his name's Pastor Jonathan Shelley, and he started uh, a church on the south side of Houston called Pure Words Baptist Church. And I remember when they were when that church was starting. I went to some of these conferences uh, that uh, that Pastor backed me on. Uh, we went to the Soul Winning Conference. People said, where are you going to go to this church? I said, well, no, I serve at Pastor Cobb's Church in Springcrest. They're like, well, you're not worried that there's another church coming to Houston? I was like, you realize that the surrounding areas, Houston proper is 2.5 million, and Houston itself, with all the surrounding suburbs and everything, 6 million people. If I were to get 10% of 6 million people in our congregation here, you're talking 600,000 church members. I think there's plenty of church members to go around. And you know what? There's not enough laborers to go do the work of the Lord. I mean, really, I'm actually happy that we have other like-minded individuals that want to do that, that I know that we're going to be out there. You know, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes there's Sundays when we go soul winning, and I'm, I didn't mean to get on this tension, but it's because well, I'll prove it. I'll show you why we're there right now. But sometimes we're out there Sundays, and because I did my research on the soul winning here in Houston, there's not that many churches. And as a matter of fact, of the churches that I think go soul winning, I don't think any of them do soul winning like us. It's not a pat on our back. It's just saying most of them have like a two times a month or one time a month, and they call it visitation, or they go visit the shut-ins, or they just go to like a, a public location. And we do need to minister to our congregation. We do need to be there for them. But what I'm talking about is soul winning to the lost. You know, visitation, if I'm visiting a brother or sister in Christ, that's good. They need our company. They need our support. But if they're saved, that's not, we're not re-saving people. We're not in the business of doing things over again because God said he did it once. So we save people once and for all. So anyways, I'm real excited. That the, and, uh, and I was preparing for this sermon. These, these verses came out. The reason that I'm saying it is because that pastor named his church Pure Words Baptist Church, and he based it on these set of verses. So obviously, we've, when you're like-minded, you follow the same progression. It's the same thing. You, you end up coming to the same conclusion. One of the things that really annoys me about preachers is that they try to figure out something new in the Word. They're trying to come up with the new and exciting thing that just nobody else saw for thousands of years. All these great minds throughout history didn't figure this one out until they came along. Look, at some point, I'm probably going to pe preach similar or the same sermons as other people because there's only so much word and there's, the lessons are all the same. They're in there. But let's go to Psalm 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, and it says, the, word of the, Lord, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So if we believe... And we have faith on the Word of God that Jesus is the Word. He was made flesh and He walked among us, right? The Bible tells us it was preserved, preserved them from this generation forever. Then we just got to believe that this is the Word of God. Now, there's two ways of doing this, right? When you're new in the faith, you believe because they showed you some verses like this. And then you have faith. But it's really our responsibility as Christians to then take this and start writing it on our hearts and memorizing the Word and reading the Word day and night and proving it to be true. Now, we don't need to prove it to be saved, but it is a good study to grow in our life with Christ. You know, the more you read the Word, as a matter of fact, I would challenge anybody listening to this sermon to go prove that this is God's Word because one of the things that's going to come out of it is not so much that you're going to prove that it's God's Word, but the the, the change that it's going to have on you, on the way that you look at sin, at the way that you walk in your, in your daily uh, communion with God, in the way that you work at, at your job or your business, at the way you treat your family, at the way you treat others, at the way you raise your children. I mean, there's just a lot of good stuff in here about how we should live for God. And then I added this one at Psalm 119, verse 89, and you don't have to go there for the sake of time. Uh, if you want to go to 2 Samuel, verse 23, go to 2 Samuel, verse 23. I mean, chapter 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23, but Psalm 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So look, God's already told us that his word's been settled in heaven. How long? Forever. And I love asking that question. It's so interesting how we just, you know, that's another attack on the word of God. People don't even, uh, either they choose not to, or maybe they're just not teaching in the public school systems anymore, or the public full system, but... There, something's going on because I'll knock on doors and I'll ask them, look, if God gives you a gift that lasts forever, when can he take it away? And the first thing is like, well, 
when it ends. Well, forever doesn't end. So when can he take it? Never. He's never going to take it away because it's forever. Forever is a concept that I know we don't understand, but we, we have an idea of. And, you know, I don't know. They used to teach it a lot more. I mean, I remember learning about infinity. I mean, we used to play stupid games, you know, and it's like tag, you're it. You know, no touchbacks. Infinity times infinity, which is really dumb, right? Because that's redundant. There is no such thing. I mean, it's just infinity. But that concept was around. It just it doesn't seem like it's around as much because I do run into that quite a bit where people, we have to explain that forever is not, it has no beginning and no end. It's been around forever. But go to 2 Samuel uh, 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23, we're going to be there in verse 1, 1 through 2, and it says, Now these be the last words of David. David was a man after God's own heart. We know that, right? David, the son of Jesse, say, said, The man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God, of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. See, when people want to speak because one of the, the other attacks that we get on the Word of God is that they, they want to separate the Old Testament from the New. Right? And they also want to separate how salvation was in the Old versus in the New. And let me tell you something, and, and this is why I, I encourage people, they should come to church here because pastors preach a great message. One of my favorite messages from Pastor Cobb is, you know, that rock that's spoken about in Corinthians that followed them. It says that rock was Jesus Christ. And I didn't put that verse here because that just came to me right now, but it says, and his word was in my tongue. See, David knew of the coming Messiah. And his faith was on Jesus. It's not like we have faith on Jesus, meaning we call upon the name of the Lord, but they called upon the name of the Lord, they just didn't know his name was Jesus. Right? Because that, that was given to them. But the same is salvation by grace. And we can then go to Hebrews 11 and we can see all of that. I'm not going to go into that right now. But go to 2 Corinthians 17 and then we'll close out. Go to 2 Corinthians 17. 2 Corinthians 17. And I really, you know, I mean, there's a lot more set of verses you can add to this. And, uh, you know, you got to give credit where credit is due. But I really like the way this flows. And that's why I used it. But let me just show you why this is so important. Go to 2 Corinthians, I mean, sorry, 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 2. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, sometimes I have a, a little bit of, I really do have a little bit of dyslexia. I, I inverted the numbers. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 17. And by the way, that's not, it's not a pity or anything. It's not, I've never been diagnosed. Every once in a while, when, especially if it's been long days, I'll, I'll have a tendency to invert numbers. Don't feel bad for me. I'm not going to cry wolf or I don't need any handicapped, you know, uh, Bible or, uh, you know, any special privileges, the Bible, it was just a, a point I'm making here. So, because that's the other thing, right? That's an attack on God's word. This whole thing about sympathizing and victimizing the world. Because what have we done is we just pick the victims, right? That's one of the things that I was going to talk about. Might as well just go into it. You know, the Sodomites, that was a illegal not too long ago. It hasn't even been 100 years. 50, 50 60 years ago, that was illegal to be a Sodomite. Not only in this country, but in most of the world. Legal and punishable by law. Like you get to thrown in jail, there was fines, and it was considered a mental disorder. And they made a plan, these sodomites got, to victimize themselves to where everything is sympathetic to them, and now people feel bad for them instead of calling them out for the sinful perverts that they are. I mean, really, that's what's happened. So anyways, so please, I'm not sympathizing myself. I, I'm not asking you for your sympathy or, you know, I don't need your pity. I just messed up. I'm a human. I'm going to make mistakes. So anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, or as, uh, you know, the president would say, 2 Corinthians, says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. See, we have to have faith in God. We have to have faith in the word and in Jesus because then we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. See, that's what's going on with the world. Satan's real good at corrupting the Word of God, but as sincerity, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So there it is. The conclusion of the whole thing is Christ is the Word. The Bible tells us for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the thing is that the world continues to attack through these massive marketing uh, 
schemes, I guess you could say it, because these are the the, th the themes and, and the and the uh, moral dilemmas of the day. I'm going to you know point out a couple, but just a couple points before that. You know, if Jesus is the Word, then the Word must be perfect. If Jesus is the Word, then the Word must be perfect, right? And we believe, or I believe, and I hope you guys believe, and I've learned this, you know, this is not something new to me, this is something that comes from anybody who believes, and if you learn it, and we, we showed you the verses about per, per, preserving, it says we believe in the holy inspiration of Scripture, we believe that God wrote the Bible, that He inspired men to pen the Bible, but we also believe that He preserved Scripture. You know, we didn't get our Bible, like the NIV, from a trash can, and just call it older, so it's better. Not everything that's older is better. Some stuff is, but you know that's why it's called antiques, right? And you go to an antique shop, and sometimes it's just old. It's not good, you know. So, and Satan has attacked the Word of God, and he's still attacking it today. Here's a couple of things that that we have to be very careful on. And I mean, we we repeat these all the time. But what's going on is that the these themes that you see out there are meant, in my opinion, to create just a, a dialogue so that we become desensitized for it. So the, let, let me give you an example. Like, Murder is not looked upon the same as it was maybe 100, 200 years ago because of the advent of television and now media. You know, we portray murder and we show bloodshed so people don't take it like they used to. It's not as serious as it once was. Now for us that are Christians, we believe in life and in death. And we believe in the eternal life and death. So for us, it's a very serious thing. So we don't take it lightly. But when you create this, this, the talking points, then all it does is it just keeps allowing you to get accustomed to that perversion. And so like, for example, you know, how has uh, the Satan attacked the Word of God? You know, we murder babies. And we talk about it a lot. But how many people actually are, feel it? How many people have lost tears? How many people are sore? How many people are actually fighting the fight to stop the murder of babies. Not many. You know, the politicians call it, you know, they're like, oh, we're for pro-life or pro-abortion, but they're just getting a vote. But see, we preach it so that maybe somebody in the audience, somebody in the congregation, somebody that we talk to, well, they might be pregnant, might be considering it, and they would stop from considering the murder of another child, of another human being, right? And I was watching uh, a, a documentary on the, because uh, I, you know, for my business, I consult with a lot of doctors, and one of the things that doctors do is they use medical devices or prosthetic devices, and there's a thing called uh, a 510K, and it's a PMA, and I'm not going to go into all that, but it's, it's part of the FDA process of how you bring medical devices to market. So, for example, if you're going to wear a prosthetic, if you have a hip replacement, that went through a process, quote unquote, of safety checks and balances so that when that's inserted in your body, you know, it doesn't create an adverse effect and kill you. The challenge is uh, the documentary was talking about how flawed the system is, how, you know, that it's all about money and how, you know, it's all about just pushing an agenda and really the agenda is the love of money. But what I thought was interesting is we push the medical industrial complex on people and we forgot that God's told us how to care for our bodies. And for the most part, he tells us, don't put anything unclean. You know, don't do anything. Don't damage the temple of God. Well, one of the, the examples that, that stood out while, while I was writing the sermon was, uh, you know, there's, I guess, cobalt hip replacements. And it's cobalt on cobalt in the joint. Well, cobalt's a poison in the body. And the cobalt was, fall, like, eroding off the hips. And it was causing mental, well, that, not it was, it is causing mental uh, dysfunction in the people that, have these hips to the point of psychosis and what but the biggest farce is not so much that is that the medical industry for uh, for the uh, devices they won't address it so when these people go to their doctors and they're showing these signs of mental illness they're being diagnosed for dementia or Alzheimer's or you know um, psychosis and they're given prescription medication to offset this, but the reality is it's real simple fix because it's not a real disease. If you just get rid of the cobalt and the body gets clean, you get back to life. And, I mean, you get back to normal. But the challenge is most of these guys don't know that because they're not disclaiming that or they're not disclosing that 
when they're selling the product because it's all for the almighty dollar. And, and then they showed us an interesting statistic about how more than 10 million people in the U.S. have some kind of prosthetic in their, in their body. And the FDA not only regulates the devices that get brought to market here in the U.S., but in the entire world. And then the second thing was, uh, you know, they said something like, there's three, you know, one company, I don't remember, I think it was Johnson Johnson, paid out like $300 million in lawsuit settlements. You mean, that sounds like a lot. That's a lot of money. But it, it, it paled in comparison to the $623 billion in revenue that they brought in. No wonder these guys don't care. I mean, do the percentage. $300 million is like, I mean, they probably spend that in a day with the amount of money that's coming in. They don't care. But we care because we have faith on the Word of God. But why that, the attack is because when you say, well, look, doctor, you know, I want to do my research. Oh, well, you're not a doctor, so you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I grew up with a doctor. I've heard that more than once. Look, hey, Dad, I was reading, and I think, and this. And he goes, where'd you get your degree, 7-Eleven? And there is truth, right, to the fact that doctors have put time and effort into studying. But you know what? If you study the medical industrial complex, and I didn't mean to get off on this, I'll end with that, is that they're taught to push drugs. It's the pharmaceutical industry, it's the medical device industry that trains them. They're not taught to treat the body anymore. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not pretending to be one, I'm just saying that it's good for us to do our research. God's given us a formula of health. God's given us a way to address these things. There's nothing wrong with wanting to know more about what we're going to put in our bodies before we put them in our bodies. But most people go in like drones and they're like, doctor, I'm sick. Doctor says, take this. Oh, thank you, doctor. Not knowing what kind of drug, what kind of testing, what kind of chemical they've put in there, we just do it. Who cares? And then you're like, well, I feel sicker than I, than I act. I'm not getting better. I'm sicker. Well, maybe you have thought that that was going to affect your liver and your kidneys and your brain and your heart and everything, your nervous system. You're putting drugs into your body. That's the effect. Now, is there a time and place for everything? I'm not saying stop going to the doctor. I'm just saying do your homework. Study. Get the right thing. And then where, this is an attack on God, right? Because he says put no unclean thing inside of you. You know, ours is the temple of the body of God, right? And where are the other attacks? Now, fornication is rampant. Cohabitation is rampant. People are just doing whatever they want. Nobody wants to have kids anymore. You know, lawlessness is rampant. I just read an article that supposedly, I read it actually right before we started because I had heard about it, that, you know, France just passed that there's no consent of, of age for sexual intercourse. And the reality is, that there's never been an age. So think about it. You can't, uh, you can't prosecute an adult man if he were to be with a young lady, like a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old girl, if, she, if you can convince her to consent to that. Well, look, according to God's word, that's pedophilia. I don't need any consent. Because you can manipulate a young child to do anything, especially if you're the one that's given authority and power and you put fear on that child. That's pedophilia. You know what the punishment for pedophilia is in the Bible? Death. It's pretty simple. But we have an attack on God's Word. You know, we attack it with the oneness movement or polytheistic movement. Oh, we all serve the same God. Just different names. Allah, Buddha, you know, Krishna or whatever. If I got it wrong, I don't care. Evolution. That's another one, right? In the beginning, it said the Word said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. But we say, no. No, it came from nothing. But the Bible says that in darkness, you can't understand the Word. And, you know, let me read that last part. I said, it said in, in John 1, it said, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's why we make up evolution. You know, you got the military-industrial complex. Yeah, we do wrestle, but we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the principalities, right? We're, we're, we're more uh, eager to go to war than to lead souls to Christ. Right? And I'm all for self-defense. If somebody comes into our house and attacks my children, believe me, we will be defending our house. Amen. But if they're not picking a fight with me, I'm going to first try to lead them to Christ. My, my goal is not to go bomb and shoot every, you know, Joe, Harry, and what, I don't know how the saying goes. That's how, you know, I grew up on the border. I'm Mexican. I don't know that, 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 that saying. But... I'm not going to just pick a fight with anybody, but the fight I will pick is God's Word. So, in conclusion, you know, we just got to have faith on the Word. 
and prove it with the Bible. See, what I did was I took you through that. And, I, and, and the other thing is, uh, you know, we got to stop being so pompous and arrogant, like we can figure stuff out. Look, if somebody has it better than us or figured it out better than us, just use it. You know, that's what God's Word's for, is for us to go out there and use His Word. You know, we've, I've read the Bible so many times, and every once in a while, some pastor will preach a sermon, I'm like, man, I don't remember that verse. I've, I don't remember reading that. That's good. Let me use it now. Let me learn from it, and, and then exhort other brothers and sisters in Christ for it. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your Word, Lord. And thank you for giving us the privilege to have faith on you, Lord, and know that it's eternal, and know that we stand for something, and that no matter what comes our way, and no matter what challenges we face, we're willing to take them to the grave, because we know that there's a better life for us, there's an eternal life that you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's all in your Word, right here. For us, it's the King James, for other languages, you know, we can look, and we can prove it, just by tracing it to who preserved it, and how how they got that preservation of the Word, Lord. But help us to stay firm. Help us to be strong in Your Word, Lord, and to fight the attacks of the devil. Because His whole agenda is to destroy the Word, to be the Antichrist, to be like God, so that when the Antichrist does come and He takes on that form, He acts like God. He will be a Savior to the world, but He won't be our Savior. Thank You for all that You do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.